been looking, we've been, we started looking at these uh, conditional statements in the Bible, and they are really, you know, I mean, they pack a punch when you start reading these because it helps clarify a lot of the uh, commandments and the expectations of God. And of course, we, we took a couple of weeks looking at the very first one, which is really, I mean, it's so big to realize that, you know, the very first conditional statement that was in the, you know, that we even read that God has revealed to us has to do with worship. And so we, we know that that is, you know, and that's something that has carried through all of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so it's, uh, we know that that's very important. Tonight I want to look at some from Exodus. And uh, Exodus has a number of conditional statements. We're not going to, we're not going to hit all of them. But there are some really, there are some, re, there are some really uh, important ones to know. Some important ones that God wanted the Jews to know as they were going through this uh, this wilderness wandering. And of course, God leads them out of Egypt and then all the way across the wilderness until they get to uh, Canaan. But we're going to be taking a look at uh, some of these in Exodus. And there's a couple of them. There's actually two different kinds of conditional statements that we see in Exodus. And we see a lot of these different conditional statements throughout the Bible. You know, and then, you know, um, the most popular, of course, is the if statements. If this, then this. And that's, you know, those are those are really easy to decipher, and you really, you know, you can't get around those. I mean, the conditions laid out right there, just, you know, such as it was with the way to worship. But then we have other ones that uh, start out whoever. And what, what does whoever mean? Anybody? It's in, by implication, it means everyone, isn't it? If I say, you know, if I, if I was to say, well, oh, well I'm, let's see, I'm trying to think of a good secular one to use. God uses these, uh, he reveals these whoever statements um, that really uh, make it easy to understand as well. And, uh, so, you know, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of those uh, if we have time to get to them. But we see that, uh, you know, from early on, um, in the, uh, there's, a, there's a big whoever statement that uh, shows up in um, chapter 12, which we'll look at in just a moment. But I want to look at all the if statements first. But if you look at Exodus chapter 15, and you can start turning there. Actually, I'm just going to know we're in Exodus. Okay, in chapter 15, beginning about verse 22. And it goes through about verse 26. We see in this one that, uh, you know, this is a part where they, they kind of complain, um, and we'll read that in just a moment. But this, this is basically God being presented. In fact, we're going to look at, you know, each one of these that we're going to be looking at, God is sort of seen as a, with some of his different features or some of his different characteristics, okay? This is God as a provider in this one, Okay. So chapter 15, beginning in about verse 22, we see God as a provider. In fact, when you look at this in Exodus, uh, in verse 22, and then I want, to, I want to back up after that to kind of look at this in its context, because every one of these, they are conditional statements in and of themselves, but they're really, when you can read the context that's surrounding them, really helps to kind of decipher everything with what's going on. But in verse 22 it says, you know, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness, and what happened? They found no water. So they essentially ran out of water. Now when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah, for they were bitter, and therefore the name of it was called Merah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, well, what should we drink? And so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, and here's the, here's the conditional statement right here, 
He tells them, if you diligently heed the, vo the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so we see right here, this you know, God is this provider of them. They, you know, here they are going through the wilderness. By the, you know, that word mara, when you see that, by the way, means bitterness. Hold your place right there. Someone turn to Ruth chapter 1. And verse 20. And we see a reference to this word in Ruth. And it's a statement made by uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth 120, for those who uh, get there first. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, Mara for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Okay, so Ruth, or Naomi says, Don't call me Mara, for the, or call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Why did she say a statement like this? It's sort of a, you know, it's, it's in a different, it's in a different uh, context as far as you know, because we're dealing with water in one that, you know, that was very bitter, but that word Mara means bitter. You see Naomi use it, and she says, call me Mara because the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. How does, why she say, you know, why, why would she use this? Why would she say that? Okay. Okay. So she's, you know, so, so she's attributing this to God and how, you know, and what's been happening, what happens to her. What happened to, what happened to Naomi? What happened to Ruth and Orpah? <laughs> Their husbands died. They all had that in common, didn't they? Their, I mean, you know, and so you think this is, you know, and this is how Naomi's looking at being dealt with is you know in this bitter in, in this bitter way she says the lord or the almighty has dealt very bitterly with me and so that that's what that name mara means when we see that now we see it in scripture in exodus chapter 15 right here and uh, god's you know he uh you know we see how they complain what's interesting about this is if you look all the way back at uh, verse 1 of chapter 15 it actually doesn't you know it doesn't start out with them complaining like this it actually starts out with, uh, a, you know, it's a, it, with uh, Moses praising God. You look in verse 1, it says, Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord, and they spoke. And why, why would they sing a song to the Lord? Okay, well, they're happy. Why are they happy? The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Okay. <laughs> Who's he talking about right there? The Egyptians. The Egyptians. I mean, these are, you know, you think of how long they were in slavery. Moses gets them out of slavery, thanks to God. He gets them across the Red Sea. And as we see, you know, I mean, that's where we saw in verse 22, it says Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. That was a huge event in the lives of all these different Israelites because they're finally out from under. They're, they are free. For the first time in their lives, they're tasting freedom. They're, ta you know, they're not tasting the hard the, the hardness of Pharaoh and the way that he's dealing with them, they come, they finally get out from under that, and now they realize that you know they know that they're you know that they're follow, being followed up until that Red Sea. Then Moses, of course, he parts it. They cross. It swallows up all of Pharaoh's uh, all of Pharaoh's men, and the first thing that they do is they start praising God. And you see in verse one of chapter fifteen how Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider. As Brenda said, he was thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, and my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, who rose against you, you sent forth your wrath, and it consumed them 
like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths, look at this right here. This is where it gets really interesting. The depth, what do the depths do that he talks about right here? What does congealed mean? That's like jello. It's gelatinous, isn't it? Not only did God get them across the Red Sea, but when he parted the Red Sea, you know, you probably see a lot of artist renderings or you see movies. Remember the Ten Commandments and how uh, Charlton Heston reaches, you know, reaches out with the staff and you know, the special effects that parts the water. And if you've ever been to Universal Studios, they show you, you know, how the water's parted you know, like that. But it was the waters, but it was still water, wasn't it? But that's not how it happened. Think of this. When that water's parted, not only did he make the waters part, he changed the whole nature of that water. He congealed it to make the water gelatinous. And I can only imagine, and that's what congealed means. He congealed the waters, meaning it was like jello on each side of them. Can you imagine seeing the water all of a sudden solidify like that? And then everything that you see inside the water, all the fish and the you know, and all the plants and everything that was that would have been floating around in the water or swimming around in the water all of a sudden would have come to a stop because those waters were congealed. And then they, they cross over and uh, it says the floods, you know, stood, the, the floods stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I'm going to pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil, and my desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. So Pharaoh was very confident in pursuing them. And he says, you blew with your wind. The sea covered them, and they sank like lead. So, they, see, it, so all the Israelites get across. The water still congealed. So think, you know, Pharaoh's thinking, well, they're going to be easy to catch, aren't they? So he starts going after them. And the moment he does, the waters become uncongealed. And what happens? Isn't that amazing when you start looking at the power that God has with certain things? How and, did you know they were congealed? I'm sorry? How did you know they were congealed? That, well, that's what it says in verse 8 of uh, chapter, chapter 15. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. How amazing is that to think that he changed the whole nature of the water. And then it changed back, and it, you know, it flooded them. It, you know, they, they sank, it said. And so we have this amazing event right here. And it, didn't, you know, and, there, and it wasn't too long after that now they're in the wilderness again. They're in a safe spot. They're, you know, they're finally starting to go through the wilderness, and all of a sudden, they're out of water. And he's reminding him right here in verse 22. Moses is writing this, remember? Just a short time after that, they were freed, you know, after they were freed, after the Egyptians drowned in the Red Sea, they're looking forward to reaching Canaan, and then they run out of water. And looking back and realizing, I mean, think of, think of what these, these Israelites just saw. And just probably within days of leaving this, I mean, they saw an entire, you know, huge a deep sea, or excuse me, deep river, or, you know, the Red Sea part, congeal, uncongeal. They saw all of these plagues that were cast on Pharaoh and his men, and they were all isolated, by the way. It wasn't like the Israelites felt any of this. It was only that, you know, they kept, the way they kept them is that the Israelites were in one spot. The Egyptians were in another spot so that they could keep a close eye on all of them. And this plague was just for all of the Egyptians, Pharaoh's men. I mean, it was an isolated account. So they got to see all of these these 10 plagues happen and there's you know so the, these miracles that were taking place and the first sign that they the, the first sign of, of an obstacle that they run into we're out of we're out of water Moses knowing all of the things that God was capable of doing because they saw him do it or they saw the results of it did they pray Lord, you know, you've got us this far. We know that you'll probably, you know, we know that you can provide for us. What did they do? What did they? Grumbled. They grumbled. They complained. Why would they do something like that? Why do you, you know, you think of this. You know, you see people 
even today. Everything's going great, and when it's going great, you know, we, that's why, you know, that's where the people become really fickle. Do we not do that? Everything's going great, and we're just, you know, we are thanking God, and we are praising God, and everything is, you know, we are so on fire, right? We love it. I'm going to, you know, I'm, we're going to worship all the time, because it's just, my life is, could not be better, and all of a sudden, something happens, and then What? We complain the same way, don't we? Instead of praying and praising him and thanking him or doing what we should be doing the first, you know, first time, instead we impulsively react to it instead of respond to it. Why do you think that happens? Immaturity. That's probably part. That's probably a big part of it. That's a fair point. You know, we look back and we probably read this, not, probably maybe not this extensively in depth, but we know, hey, we know that they, you know, that God provided. There was never a time because we know the Israelites made it all the way across. We know they made it into Canaan eventually, forty years later. But we look back and say, well, they, you know, they, why could they not see this? But when you're right in the thick of it and it's happening to you right now, we, you know, we have a tendency to do the same, don't we? How interesting that is for, you know, to respond to something or re reacting to something like that. You know, when we have, when we fall on hard times, and we will, and it's going to happen to all of us in different ways, you ever thought, you know, I'm, it is hard, and you start looking and assessing everything going on around, but you've ever just kind of taken a step back and just realized, you know, God got me this far. I've gotten this far, and here I am right now, tonight, and I'm here. And I got through it, and there were things that we thought that we'd probably never get through. There were financial situations we probably, we'd, you know, that we thought we'd never get through. There were times where, you know, you look at your cupboard and think, how in the world am I going to eat this month, or... You know, have you ever have you ever stressed about finances and you just seem to be working paycheck to paycheck, or even, you know, you've been in the red and you just, you know, and you think, how am I going to get through this? Yeah. And then you are. We have a good example provided to us with Job. Expand on that. Well, Job, every time calamity came, he said, "Blessed be the name of the Lord." It's amazing just how, you know, different responses for different people, isn't it? Job was really, I mean, you know, Jerry was mentioning with maturity. Job was really spiritually mature in that he gave everything to God, didn't he? I mean, he knew who was taking care of him. And that's why when it happened, and, you know, and how great is that? You know, when we can decide now, okay, I am, you know, I feel so close to God, and I know things are going to come, but imagine being that prepared so that when something does happen, we're already there. We're, we already know the prayers to pray. We already know, you know, what we need to do and what we need and how to, you know, what, what's going to get us through it. I think part of it too is that um, what, what have we trained ourselves to do? You know, if, if I'm going to God with the little things, um, then when something big happens, I'm more likely to go to God with that. Um, and what example? Okay. Not what they were. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, do kids, you know, do our kids see how we handle problems? Are they going to be affected by how they see us handle problems? Absolutely. You know, they're going to, you know, if we have that stress, you know, that stressed out, just momentary lapse of reason, 
they're going to, you know, they're going to know that. They're going to see that. They're going to see how strong our faith is. They're going to see how strong we do respond to certain situations, and if we, you know, whether or not we're in control, or whether or not, you know, and, and it, it, I mean, is it wrong to be stressed? It's going to happen, isn't it? There are going to be times where we worry, and we, there's going to be times where we are concerned about it. But we also need to know that, you know, we, if we trust Him, it, you know, we are going to get through. Look at the conditional, the, the conditional statement that He gives here. I mean, here, here he is, he provides for them. The first thing they do, instead of praying to God, they complain to God because they run out of water. And it says when he cast it, you know, he says he cried out to the Lord, the Lord showed him a tree, this is Moses, and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So these bitter waters and the waters that they couldn't have drank, God provides for them. He's a provider, as we see here. And look at the conditional statement he gives them. He says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I, have brought, which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who what? Who heals you. I'm the Lord that gives this to you. This is all I ask in return. So there's this conditional statement. Says, if you do this, this is what I'm going to provide for you. And this is, you know, and this is said from the from early on. But then we start seeing, you know, we, we start seeing kind of a recurring theme where they, you know, they start going and everything's great again, right? God's providing for us, God's giving us everything we do, and then what? Uh oh, then it happens again. And then they keep, you know, and then they go a little further, and then it happens again. And every it seems, I mean, it's just they are such a fickle people back then. Everything's great as long as, you know, they're getting what they need. Then we get to chapter 19. In chapter 19, verse 1 through 6, we see God as a preserver. In other words, he's going to preserve his people, but it goes way further than that. And he starts out by reminding them, and then he goes to rewarding them. But we actually see this carried over into the New Testament with what uh, some of the apostles teach. Take a look in verse number 1 in chapter 19. Moses writes here, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Now, I want to pause right there. Because here's what's interesting that he would bring up Rephidim. What, was, what happened in Rephidim? Who knows? There was a major event that happened in the town of Rephidim. And it was uh, probably about a chapter before this is when everything went down. How many have heard of the Amalekites? The Amalekites were a tribe, they were a warring tribe, and they caused a lot of problems for the Israelites. In fact, they, we, we will see the Amalekites several times in the, in the Old Testament. Well, one of the first major battles is that the, you know, that the Amalekites wouldn't let them pass. And there was this battle that takes place. And during the battle, it is told of, you know, of Moses that if he holds up his arms, what happens? <laughs> Now does it start to sound familiar? When he holds up his arms, what happens with the Israelite army? They start winning. And it's only when he lowers his arms or starts to get tired that the Amalekites start beating them. This happened at Rephidim. So if Moses was so, you know, Moses got to the point where he's so tired that he could not hold up his arms. So what happens with two of his men? They held it up for him. And as long, you know, and because they held it up for him, they just defeated the Amalekites in Rephidim just before this. And so that was a major battle that they had won. Remember, the Israelites really were not well-versed in war at this time. They, they had been slaves their whole lives. They'd seen the Egyptians. They probably were very familiar with the Egyptian uh, military. But they were not well-versed. They weren't schooled. They weren't trained in any way. They, you know, they did what they had to to get by. But here's this battle against uh, the Amalekites. And God is with them, says that, you know, if you hold up your arms, you're going to win. If you don't, 
you're going to lose this. And so here it is being, uh, being reminded, being, they're being reminded right here after they departed from Rephidim. And then they come to the uh, wilderness of Sinai, they camped in the wilderness, and Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So he's reminding them right here, isn't he? Again, he's saying, I want, this is what I want you to tell the people. Remember what I, what I did to the Egyptians? Remember when I held, you know, when I held you up, when I protected you? Uh, you know, I, I bore you on eagles' wings. I brought you to myself. And now, therefore, and here's the condition right here. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... Then you shall be what? Then you'll be a special treasure to me above all people. So he's really building them up right here. These, you know, these Israelites who you know, go through, the, I mean, there's no way they should have won that battle at Rephidim. But now he's saying, look, so he's saying, remember what happened at Rephidim? Remember what happened with the Egyptians? He's saying, if you keep my commandments... He says, you're going to be my special people. I'm going to take care of you. And not only that, he says, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. He says, for the earth is mine. He says, you shall be to me a what? You're going to be my, a what? You're going to, okay. So he, he starts out with that. He says, you're, you're going to be a special treasure to me. And then he says, and then he goes further with that. He says, for all the earth is mine, but then you shall be to me a what? A kingdom of priests and what else? A holy, a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Think they meant a lot to God? What does this mean for us today? He tells those people, he says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you're going to be a special people to me. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be a holy nation. What does that mean to, for us today? Why is that, you know, we look at something like this and it's like, okay, well, what is it, you know, what, how, how does that benefit us? How does something like that apply to us? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And someone read 1 Peter chapter 2. First off, I want to kind of put... Peter into context when we studied Peter's letters a while back. But Peter, remember, wrote to a group of Christians that were being persecuted at that time. Both of his letters cover that whole time frame where his, these Christians were being persecuted. And, he's, and the whole purpose of writing them was to try to encourage them and to lift them up and get them to understand just how, just how amazing they were. But you get to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, someone read that if they would. You see the connection right there? First, he tells the Jews. He said, if you, will, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. You're going to be a kingdom. I, you're, you'll, you shall be made to me a kingdom of priests. You're going to be made a holy nation. And he tells this to the Jews, meaning you're going to, you know, I'm going to be over you. You're going to be mine. I'm going to protect you. You're going to be something that no one else was. And when you look at that and you compare it to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, the very same thing happens for the Christians as it did for the Jews to God. We're his people. You are a chosen generation, as Peter tells them. It's exactly what God told them, was it not? A royal priesthood. You're a kingdom of priests. We're his priest. We're a royal priest. We're not the high priest. Who's the high priest? Jesus. But he says, You're a royal, he says, you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. What did he call them? Jews. Holy nation, wasn't it? But now this, you know, the kingdom is here, and it includes both Jews and Gentiles. That had already been opened up by that time. And he's saying now to the Jews and Gentiles, he's saying, you're that royal priesthood or that kingdom of priests. You're the holy nation, and you're his own special people. 
No one else can claim that. There's not a soul in the religious world that can claim what Peter's telling them right here, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What happened to the Jews? He said, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, they're going to be called out. What happens to the Christian? Very same thing. We're to God as important as the Jews are. We're to him. And so we see how this, you know, this peculiar treasure starts to apply to us, isn't it? We are his people today. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hold your place over in Exodus because we're going to come back to that if we have time. But look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 17 and 18. So someone can read that. Okay, who's he writing to right here? Corinth. Corinth. Who in Corinth? Who's, who, who are the recipients of this letter in Corinth? Okay. What kind of people? Were they lost people? Were they Christian people? Were they... They were Christians, weren't they? They were, you know, and it was really tough back then because remember, what kind of what kind of a place did Corinth start out as? Pagan. Pagan. They were very divisive. They were at each other's throats. They were, I mean, they were not treating each other real well. And then Paul comes in, and Paul works nonstop with these people and gets them to convert to Christ. And then you see here in the second letter, towards the uh, probably about the middle of it. He says, therefore, he says, you come out, tell him to the Christians, come out from among them and be separate. That was so important because how does the world treat each other? Terrible. That was big back then because the world was treating each other how these Corinthians were treating each other originally. And that was something that Paul really had to work on them to stop mistreating each other. You're Christians now. There's no reason why you should be at, you know, tearing each other up. There's no reason why you, should be, you know, why you should be putting each other down and trying to be divisive and so forth. He says, you come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so we see this separating with the Corinth, don't we? First, we saw it with the Jews. He's saying, if you obey my commandments, I'm going to make you different than everyone else. You're not going to be like everyone else. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be this holy nation. No one else could claim that. Then we see Peter said the very same things with the same words for those Christians. We see Corinth right here. Peter's, or Paul, excuse me, saying the very same thing. He says, you be separate. Don't, don't be like the world. You're different than them. That's who we are today, is it not? We're to be separate from the world. And then you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.19, someone... Okay, there's a couple of things at play in this one passage. <coughs> he says, the, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. What's a seal? We've talked about a seal in the past. Having this seal. What did a seal do? What did it represent? Remember what it was? Remember, who, who, who remember? Well, you don't remember it because you probably you weren't around back then, but... Um, you've probably seen it in movies where they have like a decree 
and then they fold it over and they have that wax and then remember they take the ring or the signet and they stamp it into the wax what's the what, what's the indentation of it what, what is it? it's a seal what did that mean other than just seal, you know I, I mean it dried and then you know they could open it but what did that seal represent official. it's what official. it's official and who did it come from it belongs to someone doesn't it it means this is an official decree this is someone royal is making this you know is, ma- is doing this this is this you know this decree belongs to the one who's making it they have the authority to make it no one else can make that decree but he has the authority who had that signet and was able to make that seal and that's what he's saying right here in second timothy 2 19 god stands having this seal that the lord knows those who are his okay so you look at all the word of god and this letter to Timothy, and what's Timothy's preaching, the word that has been given to us, that is the seal. If we follow that, we follow his commandments, that's the seal of, you know, that's God's seal. It's like the seal of approval. That's God. We are approved of God based on who we are, based on what we follow. If we, you know, it's just, and it, and it goes all the way back to uh, Exodus that we can couple these together. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... Well, how did they know what the covenant was? What was the covenant that he's talking about? He says, if you will, if you will he- obey my voice and keep my covenant, that covenant stood for something. It was something. What was it? What was given to them? Expecting, you know, they, they were expected to keep it. The ten, well, the at least the ten, right? All of the commandments. But that, the ten were definitely there, and those were the ones that were on the stone that Moses brings down. But there's so many different commandments when you look at it. And God said, if you keep these, if you follow what I've given to you. Remember the book of the law? book of the law was what was given to the Jews. We see that in numerous places throughout the Old Testament. And they kept, they kept adding to it and then adding to it. And that's what they had. They, you know, and the great thing is that they didn't have to guess what it was. Isn't that great? It's like today. What do we have today to know what the Word of God is? <laughs> Bible. What if, you know, what if you heard someone, you know, get up in front and say, okay, you have to keep the Word of God, but we don't have any Bibles. <laughs> there's, you know, there's nothing tangible to, to see what that is. But your whole salvation, your eternal life depends on knowing every single commandment that God has given to us. And yet we don't have any Bible. Would that, number one, would that be fair for God to put us into that kind of situation? No. You think everything that God has commanded, every single thing has been revealed to us. We have the Bible today. That's how I can know. And God says, keep my commandments. And I can say, well, what commandments, God? Well, good news for me. I, you know, I've got it written down right in front of me. I don't even have to, I don't have to guess. It's right there. How many in here have ever taken a test? How many in here love taking tests? Thought they were so much fun, right? And the harder the better, right? <laughs> what, if said, what, what if someone said, okay, here, you, you got, you've got to take this test and you need to score at least a 95% on this test. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the answer sheet. Now who would love to take that test? Who would, who would be afraid of the test then? Pretty easy pleasy, right? Why do people just not read? This is, you know, this whole life, I mean, if the, you know, this whole life depends on, you know, it's contingent in the next life of what we do in this life. The great thing that we have is God has already provided this, all of this to us, hasn't he? He's given us the answers of how to get to heaven. You want to go to heaven? Just read. This is how to do it. He's provided that. There's nothing he's going to leave out ever. Never, never, never. And so we see that this is, you know, we see these people, it's the very same thing. God said, if you keep my, if if you keep my covenant, my promise, the thing that I gave to you, the testament that I gave to you, you know, that I gave to you, he says, then you shall be a special treasure to me. He didn't tell him that and say, well, good luck in trying to figure out what it is, though, because I'm not, you know, and then I'll tell, 
You know, you say something, you know, you say it, and then I'll tell you if you're right or not. It was already given to them. They had the book of the law. They had these commandments in front of them. He says, if you keep them, then you will be a special treasure. And then we get to the new one, and Peter said the same thing. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We see how Paul said, come out from among them and be separate, and we know how to be separate because we know we have the answers. And we see in 2 Timothy 2.19, we see the seal the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who, who are his. The Lord knows those who are his. Well, who are they? If God knows who they are, then there has to be something there that puts us, you know, that whoever God knows into that category, does it not? Well, how do I become, you know, I want to be in that category. I want God to know me. I want to, you know, to, like Peter's saying, right, or that, that, uh, Paul's saying to Timothy right there, the Lord knows who the, those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's the second bell, isn't it? Think of how amazing this is when we have these conditional statements so that there's no question at all where we need to be in pleasing God and where we can be in him knowing who we are. Next week, we're going to look at another one um, and, and then under, the, uh, under all of these if statements, and then we're going to start looking at whoever, and there's some big ones under whoever that we're going to be looking at. So we'll uh, pick this up next week. Appreciate everyone's uh, participation tonight.